Hey, hey squaddies. squaddies. Welcome to this week's episode of the Travel Squad Podcast. Today, we're airing one of our most popular episodes from the past three years. We have hundreds of episodes now, and lately we've been replaying the most well-received and listened to episodes, and you all have been loving it. We're going to keep giving you what you want and give new squaddies the chance to hear past episodes without having to go digging through the archives. New episodes are still launching every other week while classics like this are airing in between. Enjoy Enjoy the the show show and and happy happy Travel Travel Tuesday. Tuesday. Welcome to the Travel Squad Podcast. We adventure the world together one passport stamp at a time. We're here to share travel news, tips, and our own adventures with you. Every Travel Tuesday, we share stories on a variety of topics, including our hometown San Diego, hiking, weekenders, national parks, international getaways, and inspiring you to go on your own adventures, even if it starts with your own backyard. I'm Jamal. Brittany. And I'm Kim. And And we're we're the the Travel Travel Squad Squad Podcast. Podcast. So grab your ticket and your passport. And don't forget your travel insurance. And prepare for takeoff. Hello, fellow travelers. Hey, squaddies. Welcome to this week's episode of the Travel Squad Podcast. Today, we are bringing you 13 of the best places in the U.S. to visit in spring. Unlike winter and summer, beach towns are not the place to visit in the spring. If you want that sunny, beautiful skies, warm weather, beaches are not it. It gets cloudy, June gloom, May gray, avoid it at all costs. Well, I love how you say winter, but I want to clarify. When it's winter here in the U.S., you can always escape to places to get that little bit of warmth, right? But you are very correct in the thought process that spring lends itself to certain places and beach weather definitely is not it. And we've even touched upon this before being here in San Diego where we say like spring sometimes is not the best to come because we always have that overcast layer and you're going to go to the beach. Mm -hmm. It's going to be cold, right? So in this episode, we are giving you 12 awesome places in the U.S. to visit in spring. We've done episodes like this before in the past where we've talked about the best winter or summer, and here we are trying to round out all the seasons. Maybe fall's coming up here pretty soon, but spring Mm -hmm. today. Spring is actually one of my favorite seasons because winter's cold, it's dreary, it's long. Not here in San Diego, but you know, everywhere else it is. (laughs) And so when spring comes, the time changes, we get more daylight. People get to have this like pep in their step, this energy of the season. And you know, summer's coming, spring is here, there's flowers. It's a good time. It's like the rebirth of the world in a sense, right? It's kind of dormant during the winter, comes back to life during spring and before it gets exceptionally hot in the summer. We know this, I've said it a million times before, I hate the heat. Spring and fall are my favorite seasons. I love winter too and winter aspects, but to be in it 24 seven, it's a bit much. And again, we're very fortunate here in San Diego for that aspect. So I'm super excited about this episode right here to give you guys the inside tips and our recommendations on the best spring locations in the US. Before we reveal the destinations, you know we gotta start with the tip. Tips always first. First tip that I have is to pack for hot and cold because although the sun's coming out and it's going to be warm during the day, it can get cool really quick in the nighttime. And even sometimes in the mornings, like you may start off with a fleece or a jacket and then as the day goes on, start to shed those layers, but you're going to want those layers to have. Right. And not all spring places are springy. Some places still have snow. Heads up, one of the locations for sure that we're going to mention on here still has a little bit of snow for you. So you're going to want to have that good balance of your clothing. That way you can accessorize for all temperatures. Brittany's number one tip, download offline maps. I mean, you can never (laughs) go wrong with that. Doesn't matter where you're going or what you're doing, download offline maps. Like I feel like I still need it here in California sometimes, depending on where I'm going. I was just on a trip in... Idaho and Montana 
and we were driving through windy roads in the mountains and we lost service and we did not have offline maps. I'm really disappointed in you for that. Well, I wasn't doing the planning on this one, but you know, it was kind of a straight free I'm a little disappointed <laughs> because I know when you went on your birthday trip also, Kim, to Tennessee and Smoky Mountain National Park, you did mention on a previous episode also mm -hmm. that you lost mm -hmm. service and didn't download it. So you're preaching it, but not practicing it. But usually mom here, Brittany, is the one to download That's it. That's right. So. so make sure at least one person in your group has it. And if not, use this as an opportunity to test your navigation skills. <laughs> Another tip for you is to bring allergy medication. You know, flowers are blooming in spring, and so there's a whole bunch of pollen out, and so you may have some allergies. You don't want to spend your trip sneezing, coughing, having runny eyes, red eyes, anything like that. So pack your allergy medication. And that's a really good tip, segueing into our final tip, which is kind of look for seasonal spring events such as flower field blooms, right? Here in San Diego, now not technically San Diego, a little bit north of San Diego and Carlsbad, we're famous for the tulip fields that they have out there. They're not tulips, they're they're flowers. I don't, I don't know what kind, but I thought they were tulips. No, I don't think they have tulips, but I, I've never been, so I can't really say for sure, but that is something I've always wanted to do. So we always say explore your own backyard, right? This year, I am making a point to go. I heard on the radio very recently that they're about to start. So that's the good news yes. is they are here. So look for places and destinations like that. And one of the destinations we have on here, they have a particular blossom season that we're going to talk about as one of the main reasons why you should go also. So awesome tip. So jumping right into our list, destination number one is Savannah, Georgia. And we actually have this on our list, but we've actually never been there. We're going there in about a month and a half. We're going to be there May 14th and 15th. And the reason why we booked the trip during that time is because we heard it's a perfect time to visit Savannah, Georgia. It's also a spooky time to visit because when we go, Brittany has booked us a ghost tour. Levels. We said five to seven. Jamal was said scary level 10. Jamal was trying to go too scary, but we're going like mid. Well, we'll see which one you ladies end up picking and we're just going to rock it and go with it. But, you know, it, it's a little difficult for us to put a destination on here that we haven't been to yet. But based off of all our research and everything that we've read and seen, like I'm super excited for this trip. So mm -hmm. I know it's going to definitely be good. There's so many things that you could do in Savannah, Georgia. They have the beautiful plantations, the big trees that I don't want to say they're like the, the weeping willow trees, but but they have the big long mm -hmm. paths and things like that. The ghost tours, the historic towns. This is going to be prime time and it's in Georgia, this part of the U.S. during summer, hot and humid. You're beating it and that's why it's another great time to go in spring. And another thing that we're going to do there is a walking tour to experience all of the sights to see. So you really want to do that when the weather's good, it's not too hot, not too cold, and you can really enjoy it. Yeah, and one of their biggest draws is the city market. It's like four blocks of open-air shopping, dining, art, and everything like that. Spring, just so conducive for things like that. And so when I was doing my research for Savannah, Georgia, there wasn't a lot of hotels in the downtown area that I could really find. And so we actually ended up booking an Airbnb so that we are very walkable to all of the locations we want to visit. I'm excited excited to report back on this particular trip because we have a very special guest joining us on this one. Yes, we do. So Zaina, as you know, former squad member, my sister is unfortunately no longer part of the squad, although from time to time we still do make trips and adventures with her. However, my other sister, Nejwa, is joining us on this squad trip. So this, She's been dying to get in on a squad yeah, trip. Yeah, so a special guest, Nejwa, joining us on the trip. I don't know if she'll be here to record the episode with us, but I could tell you this. She's excited. We're excited. Savannah, it's going to be fun. We actually had a listener. One of you guys wrote us recently and, and asked if we were taking squad apps because they wanted to go <laughs> on a trip with us. And the answer is yes. If you want to go on a trip, hit us up. We'll give you an interview <laughs> checklist. And if you pass it, believe me, we're open to squad members, uh, honorary squad members, yes. I should say. And then testing the honorary, potentially permanent. Who knows? Who knows? We can just be one big old squad out there. But I'm super excited for Savannah, Georgia, because one, we haven't been there yet. We've heard a lot about it. It's supposed to be very beautiful, very historic, a little bit of spookiness to it, too. And I hear really good Southern cuisine 
bean. Ooh, I'm so red beans and rice. I'm excited for that. My gosh. And because we haven't taken that trip yet, please be sure to subscribe so that you know when this future episode launches because you know for sure we're going to release an episode on our time in the South. Destination number two, an American classic, Las Vegas, Nevada. Sin City, the capital of the world. How can you go wrong? You can't go wrong, especially in spring. And why are we recommending spring? Pool parties? Pool party season (laughs) begins in March, baby. I don't know. You know what? Kim, over 30, I don't know if she's pool party Excuse age no me? more. I bought a ticket to Splash House this year. I, I did hear that, Kim. I did hear <laughs> that. But you missed it the last two years. One of them was a COVID year. The other year, something was going on in 2021. So mm-hmm. I know you got I'm Splash House. It. But I, I got a hankering and a good feeling <laughs> that this year after Splash House, you might say... I will I'm, never I, be done. I will never be done with pool parties. Pool. She's going to get her splash tattoo this year. <laughs> oh yeah. Point being pool parties, but there's so many other things to do in Las Vegas, but since we're talking about the pool parties, I guess that's conducive to the weather and that's another reason why we're mentioning Las Vegas in spring. I've said this in many episodes before, people don't realize it. Deserts in the winter get freezing. I've been in Las Vegas where it's actually snowed. There's been icicles hanging from the Caesar Palace fountains. It's cold. And in summer, it's deathly hot. Mm -hmm. So spring is that good balance. You're going to get a good bit of warmth, but it's not going to be that overbearing summer heat and you want to enjoy it during that time. I have two side tangents about Vegas in the summer. One, I went with my friend Chelsea. We got out of the car and she's like, why do they have the heater on in the valet? It was literally the heat of summer. (laughs) It wasn't the heater. Tell me she was drinking already to make a statement She wasn't really that that drunk. Oh, no. no. I'm judging a little bit (laughs) with that comment. And then opposite of that, I was there in June once at a pool party and it was windy and cold. We were like shivering in the pool. Really? I think that's an abnormal June. Yeah, Yeah, it usually doesn't happen. Typically in the springtime, highs are in the 70s, 80s, perfect amount of heat to lay out and enjoy, but not super hot where you're just like sweating all over the place. Mm -hmm. It's also good because there is hiking and outdoor stuff to do around there. So if you want to do that, springtime is perfect for it. That is very true. Red Rock Canyon is only a 30 minute drive from downtown Las Vegas and it has some really good hikes. Well, not to mention that shopping, the malls, the fine dining, Mm. the buffets. We're just going to say the buffets, buffets. but I won't lie. When we're in Vegas, usually for Brittany and I, I don't want to say too, too fine a dining, but definitely fine dining. You're there. That's what we like to splurge on. Kim's the pool parties. Brittany and I is the uh, dining aspect. of. What was that name of the fine dining buffet we tried to go to? We tried to go to the Bacchanal Bacchanal buffet at Caesars Palace. So squad tip. Make a reservation if you want to go there. With COVID now, they had reservations. Um, I don't know if they're going to keep that. But yeah, definitely look into making reservations. It definitely doesn't hurt. That's one of the most crowded ones and supposedly ranked one of the best, if not the best, in terms of the quality of food that they use at that buffet. Yeah, so we tried to make a reservation the same day that we wanted to go to the Bacchanal. We were put on a wait list. We were number 100 on the wait list. We we never made it. We never made it. We ended up going to Scarpetta. Which was really good. They have a secret menu, by the way. Just got to ask for it like Kim did. Yep. Kim being the picky eater they made something (laughs) special for her and it was actually delicious maybe one of the best things they brought to the table that night not gonna lie and they do have views of the bellagio fountain so it's a really nice place to eat i've also eaten at some other great places like gordon ramsay steak joel rubichon's restaurant those potatoes oh potatoes potatoes. (laughs) that's what i make my famous mashed potatoes after kim is the joel rubichon potatoes Mm. mind you kim have you done any of the the shows the entertainment and I've Vegas. done some entertainment, yeah. Adult entertainment <laughs> venues? Or... I've been to the Male Hustler show. Oh, oh look at that. <laughs> Got a private lap dance. There you go. <laughs> but beyond what no. we know you can do there, so much comedy shows, Cirque du Soleil, Up Your Alley, Kim, Chippendales, and Magic Mike oh, shows. Yes. But all sorts of things, even family entertainment for that matter too. So, I mean, Vegas is just a great place to go and we really do mention spring because it's not giving you the extremes of summer and winter for it and it's a great great time to go and enjoy all that las vegas is famous for we actually have an episode on vegas it's episode 35 so go back and listen to that number three best place to visit in spring is seattle washington because this is wildflower season 
all that rain that Washington and Seattle gets comes to pay off in the springtime. We visited Mount Rainier National Park, which was right outside of Seattle, and we went in fall and there were still wildflowers. So I can't imagine how beautiful and lush it would be in the spring season. The one time, well, actually I've been there a couple of times, but one time I really went as a tourist to Seattle in August. It was so damn hot to be walking around the city, waiting in the line for the Space Needle in the heat. So the spring would be perfect because it's definitely still going to rain on you no matter when you go. But Mm -hmm. at least when you are walking around the city, because it's a very walkable city, you won't be like sweating like I was. Yeah. And speaking of the weather, Kim, and again, that's a lot of the reasons why we're listing these places is because they're perfect weather wise in the spring. Now, normally in the summer, Seattle actually has really good weather. But with the crazy weather patterns that we've been having lately and those crazy extreme heat waves, you're definitely going to want to go in spring so that you can avoid those because it's usually temperate weather in Seattle and you want to experience it with that. And it just seems so abnormal because even in the city, you go a little bit outside the outskirts, just everything is so green. And then when you feel that heat with it, it just doesn't make it feel like a conducive environment. And spring is the perfect time too. And you definitely don't want that winter rain. I mean, it always rains up there, but Mm -hmm. this is a good kind of shoulder season to avoid that. And in spring, that's when all of the snow starts to melt and there's so much runoff. The waterfalls are going to be amazing in the Pacific Northwest. I love the Pacific Northwest. So it'd be a really good time to visit some really nice waterfalls in and around Seattle. And weather-wise aside, let's talk about some of the Seattle highlights. We've all been there. What did we love about it? What's some of the must-dos, ladies? Pike Place Market, definitely going to see all of the fresh fish, the crafts the goodies. And then it's like right on the pier as well. So love that. I think it's like, obviously, if you're there, you have to do it. It's so iconic. To me, I was like, meh, it's okay. I loved the Space Needle, though. The views from up there, the glass bottom, I I thoroughly enjoyed that. And it rotates a a bit too, right? Yeah. I hear that in spring, it's the best time to go whale watching in Seattle because more than 20,000 gray whales migrate along the West Coast every single year. I need to redeem myself because the one time I went whale watching here in San Diego, saw zero whales. Zero whales. Well, I know you have family up in Alaska. I've been trying to get us to go to Alaska to do the national parks. Kim, did you go whale watching in Alaska? Negative. Negative. I'm sure (laughs) we would for sure see them when we were there, but definitely with a number 20,000 strong in the spring, you have to go do the whale watching in Seattle. On top of the other main highlights that we just mentioned, Seattle's a great hub. Brittany touched upon it earlier. Mount Rainier National Park. There's Skagit Valley, which is one hour north for their tulip festival that they have. Olympic National Park. You could drop down into Portland, go to another state, go a little bit north and go to another country and go into Canada and Vancouver. So Seattle creates a great hub to do lots of things and great time, again, weather-wise and an all-American city for sure. I bet Olympic would be so beautiful in spring because everything so green and lush and I bet there's still that like base layer of fog and kind of that eeriness to Olympic so I think that would be awesome to visit. I would highly recommend Olympic National Park if you're there and if you have four hours to drive there and back make a point to go to it. We did an episode back on episode number 68 where we we reviewed Olympic and Mount Rainier And it was a good one. If you can hit both of those on that trip, do it. Do it. And that's what I said in that episode. You know, we had gone in September and it was a little bit more warm. And I do think in spring, and I said that to you, Kim, because you had been, that was your second time. And I said, I wanted that kind of like mist and fog that's supposed to be in here. And you said, if you're here earlier in the year, you're going to get that. Well, I went in August, but I think maybe I went earlier in the morning or the day. I don't know. Check the fog weather before you head up. (laughs) Either way, springtime, highly likely you're going to hit it. That's for sure. So number four on our list is Washington, D.C. And we specifically recommend that you visit Washington, D.C. in spring because of the National Cherry Blossom Festival. Yes. So they have the festival as during certain times of year. Obviously, you know, it always changes when they blossom, but it's usually around end of March to mid-April. And Washington, D.C. and all their river walk area and everything just so beautiful with the colors, with the cherry blossoms. You know, when we were there in May, Brittany, we were clearly too too late and had missed it. And I said, I do want to go back to go see cherry blossom season in Washington, D.C. Famous for it. 
Also in May, they have a festival called Passport DC. It's a free month-long festival in May. And the first two Saturdays are entirely devoted to embassy open houses. Like, how cool would that be to go into an open house dedicated to the embassies? I mean, that would obviously be super cool. It's Washington, D.C. It's the capital of the United States, the, the diplomacy that takes place over there, and to just go in and see the open embassies. That's really unique. And until you put that on the show notes and we did that review, I had no clue that that was even a thing. You know, I thought you had to be like a foreign dignitary or somebody in politics to go into those embassies. But it has so much to offer, food, dance, music, performances, fashion. And then, you know, in spring, it's a great time to visit the Smithsonian's, the Air and Space museum is amazing and so is the museum of natural history let me ask you this since i've never been to dc is there anything to do besides museums and diplomatic excursions it's a big foodie hub Ooh, lots of michelin starred restaurants in the dc area when we were there we tried to go we were actually in dc what was it Brittany? on a monday Mm -hmm. if i remember and the restaurants were closed on those days and Mm. uh that was a little bit unfortunate on that but it is a very big foodie hub but if you're not wanting to go to the museums in particular which the museums there i'm sure are exceptional we were there during covid times and they were closed again very unfortunate so another reason (laughs) for us to go back but you could see the landmarks maybe you might might consider that to be kind of museum-y, but the Lincoln Memorial, the reflection pools, all the war memorials from World War II, Korea, etc., Washington Monument, U.S. Capitol, the White House. So you can really see all that and just everything that you've always seen on TV. If you've never been there, now you're seeing it in person. And it just has this kind of like unique feeling, let alone the fact that it's the U.S. and you know to an extent like this is kind of really where things that control the world take place in a way. It's kind of eerie but yet cool yeah so we did a quick day trip like jamal said to dc last may it's episode 100 if you want to go back and check it out and i'm going to say real quick before we move on we mentioned spring because of the weather i mean that's the general theme pretty much kind of for all of these but it gets hot humid and muggy in the summer so go in the spring otherwise you're going to be miserable and in winter you're going to freeze your ass off and there's crazy snowstorms in that area too so perfect time You want to know what I'm thinking right now? Yeah, let's hear it. Hit me with it, Kim. I'm (laughs) excited. You have this look on your face. I know the squatties can't see it, but I see it. I'm intrigued. There are so many places, especially in the eastern U.S., that are really humid, hot, and muggy. Mm -hmm. Like, what are these people wearing? Clothes so that they don't get swamp ass, that's for sure. Yeah. If you go back to our Miami episode, make it very clear, do not wear tan shorts. You evaded it though, Kim. We had a whole conversation about it. You evaded it. You evaded it. But yeah, more than likely, you know, you're probably not. Yeah, I w- Like, what are they wearing? I just think about all the people that work in D.C. that have to wear suits during Ooh, the summer. It's that probably disgusting. Definitely not tan suits. Definitely not. <laughs> I bet there's a lot of swamp ass over there. That's why they say drain the swamp over there. Okay. <laughs> Wow, Kim, you really hit us with that question. (laughs) (laughs) Number five on our list is not a hot and humid place. It is Grand Teton and Yellowstone National Parks in Wyoming. Yes. So we have two episodes on this, episode 56, 57. I do believe these were some of our more recent replays that we put on too for you guys because it is coming close to spring and now pretty much is spring and perfect time to go. The weather is great. You have that snow melt and that thaw. All the wildlife is coming out. So you have the good, nice spring warm weather, still kind of chilly, but not too cold. And yet the backdrop of the snow, but not too much snow either. We actually went in late May, early June. Perfect time to visit. Like I remember when we were hiking up to Hidden Falls, the waterfall was just gushing and flowing and there was still snow on the ground even. And I talked to my dad who actually went to Grand Teton and Yellowstone this past summer and he went later in the season and he said there really wasn't much of a a good waterfall. And Mm -hmm. it was just a completely different experience than what we had. So I was like, oh, okay, well then, you know, spring is the best time to visit for sure. I would say the only bad thing about visiting during this time is that you'll probably be taking on and off your light sweater because it's it's not hot and it's not cold, but it's just in that middle part where you're going to want it. Oh, yeah. And then you start moving and then it gets warm and then you stop and then it gets cold. 
cold or a little gust of wind. Yeah. So, I mean, that's more the big inconvenience, but all the pros that come from going at this time, I definitely do think outweigh that. Like Brittany said, scenery wise for the waterfalls and they're just gushing. Wildlife is abundant. They're coming out from... We saw bears. Yeah, of course. But they're all just now thriving in spring, whereas they were sheltering in the winter. So they're out and about. You're going to see a lot more wildlife. Winter wise, you can't even come here. There will be so much snow. A lot of the trails will be closed. So it's completely off limits. Summer, you're going to hit the families, the vacationers, Mm -hmm. the foreigners. It's going to be very crowded. Spring is the perfect time to go. Yeah, you may want to pack some crampons, though, because there were a few hikes that we went on where snow was still on the ground and we could have probably used the crampons for a bit. Okay, I need to address the crampons. Address it. (laughs) So I I said I was in Idaho and Montana last weekend and I purchased some for this trip because there was going to be snow. And I was with my two friends and at one point I said, I'm really glad we had the crampons because we really needed them. And they're like, crampons? Did you just make up that word? Because they call them ice cleats. Oh. And they never heard the word crampon before. And I was like, I didn't just make that up. It's not like a variation of tampon I just made up. I had to show them the Google listing that that it's referenced in that way. Ice cleats. You know, that makes a lot of sense, (laughs) but that sounds like the lazy way to say it. Like they don't know the word, which clearly they did. They are labeled as all of those things. I know. I I believe it, but I've just never heard it. But it's almost one of those things like where I see on BuzzFeed. It's like, we can tell where you live based on what you call these things. If they're like fireflies or lightning bugs Mm -hmm. or whatever the hell else they're called. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. So I wonder if it's one of those Well, they're from San Diego, so. They're also... (laughs) Never heard of ice cleats. Micro spikes too. Like chain, some- like, well, I've never heard them called chains, but they look like chains for your feet. Chains for your feet. So anyway, crampons, ice cleats, those are all the same thing. If whatever term you use. Yes. But let's talk a little bit about Yellowstone and Grand Teton. At Yellowstone, you're going to see the famous geological formations of all the hot springs, geysers. It's so amazing out there. One of the most unique things that you can really see. I mean, you're going to see wildlife and you're going to see crazy geological formations that you've probably never, ever seen before in your life. Some really impressive shit out there. Yes. And then Grand Teton, we've said it many times before. I'm going to say it again because I really loved it. I think it's one of the most scenic national parks that I've ever been to beauty wise. Like if you want to feel kind of like a little bit like you're in Europe, I felt like this was the place in terms of the way the mountains looked, the meadows that were actually there and how they Mm -hmm. were so full of color. And it's just like when you see Europe and the Alps, like I got that vibe out here. So it's really, really cool. And Grand Teton's known for hiking, boating, fishing, and horseback riding. And Jackson, Wyoming is the town closest to this national park, and it's super fun. I really enjoyed it. It's small, it's quaint, it's rustic. I feel like I'm in the wild, wild west, but not too wild at the same time that I don't have those modern comforts. <laughs> Very family friendly and really good barbecue. Ooh, Absolutely. That you, barbecue you wouldn't so think barbecue good. out there, but it was good. Mm-hmm. Big hole. I'm going to say it again. The fourth hole? No, we started seventh, talking about the fourth hole. hole. <laughs> <laughs> seventh hole. Oh, man. Big hole. Yeah, that, you know. That trip really sparked my love for barbecue. And I have been on a mission to try barbecue pretty much everywhere else since. And that's why we put number one on there, Savannah. Can't wait to have the barbecue out there too. Just going to flash back to that. Hey, squatties. We want to share one of our favorite travel products with you. Liquid IV is a category winning hydration brand fueling your well-being while traveling. One stick fits into 16 ounces of water to give you three times the electrolytes of traditional sports drinks and hydrates you two times faster than water alone. Their half-ounce hydration multiplier powder packet is the one product you need in every suitcase, carry-on, and day pack. We use it while flying on planes because flights can be so dehydrating. We use it when we feel jet-lagged, when we're out on a hike, and after a long night out that has us feeling worn out. In just one stick, you get five essential vitamins, B3, B5, B6, B12, and vitamin C. Liquid IV also now comes in 12 delicious and refreshing flavors to keep your hydration routine exciting. Our favorites are the lemon lime and tangerine with immune support. It's made with premium ingredients, all non-GMO and gluten, dairy, and soy free. Get 20% off when you go to liquidiv.com and use Travel Squad Podcast at checkout. That's 20% off anything you order when you shop better hydration today using promo code Travel Squad Podcast at liquidiv.com. Hey, squatties, let's take a quick detour to talk about our travel itineraries that we've created just for you. 
We just launched several new international trip itineraries, including Tulum and Japan. This is on top of the itineraries we already have for U.S. trips like the Hawaiian Island of Kauai, the U.S. Virgin Islands, as well as national park trip itineraries, including Utah's Mighty Five National Parks and a week at Grand Teton and Yellowstone. These fully built out 20 to 30 page PDF guides are available for instant download on our site right now. Every detail of the trip is laid out for you. So all you have to do is download, book, show up, and have fun. The itineraries tell you where to fly into, the exact route to take, where to stay, park entrance prices, where to eat, driving distance between attractions, the things to see and do, even the hikes we recommend, their mileage, and the time to allot for each one. And believe it or not, so much more. Be sure to head over to TravelSquadPodcast.com to download your very own comprehensive travel itinerary today. So number six on our list is one of my favorite places to visit, Sedona, Arizona. Spring is a perfect time to visit because the days are warm, but the nights and the mornings are still very cool. Extremely cold. I was actually there in March for a yoga festival and did a sunrise yoga session, and it was so fucking cold, I had to stop halfway through and go inside. Well, and that's why there's the good tip that we mentioned earlier, pack for both, right, Kim? Because Sedona is one of those places. I mean, it's hot, it's a desert, yet during the winter, and here we are straddling that line, during the day, it's not going to be too hot. It's going to be very nice, very comfortable, but you get to those evenings and mornings, and you got that chill factor. But it definitely balances out because there's a lot of beautiful scenery and hikes out there, so perfect time to do the hiking in the mornings, early evenings, and kind of even beat that mild heat and warmth that they do have there. But Sedona is just so, so beautiful. And we just keep finding ourselves always wanting to go back. I want to go back. Really do. Well, we need to do it as a squad trip because we haven't even done it as a squad trip yet. I know. We we need to make this happen. I think it'd be a good one. This spring. I was going to (laughs) say spring. Yeah, you know, we have found $45 flights to Phoenix and then driven for there. But also from coming from San Diego, it's an eight hour drive to Sedona. So it's actually not too bad if you break it up, like leaving on a Friday night, driving to Phoenix and then doing the rest of the drive Saturday morning. It makes it for an easy weekend or trip. We actually have a full episode on Sedona, episode 73, where we give a lot of good details talking all about it. However, we have since gone back since releasing that episode, so we do have more information on it too. So it's very complete, but I also want to say to an extent, not as much information as we do have now on it, but very good episode to go back and listen to. But let's talk about a little bit of the highlights that Sedona has to offer. Well, Sedona is known for its healing properties and all of the vortexes that are in the whole entire town, like around the town. And so it's a great place to hiking because you can get to the center of some of these vortexes. You ladies believe in that yuppie stuff? Uh huh. Yeah, (laughs) I do too, actually. And, you know, when you're there, it's one of those things that you hear about it. And if you're not into that, you really don't believe it. And then you're there and you just have that sense of calm and relaxation that just really takes over you. And I do believe it. So there's several places is where they have the vortexes or vortices. Is that how you would say it? Plural? Vorticei. Vorticei. <laughs> We're going to have to look in uh, Webster's Dictionary and get back to you on the plural of vortex. But there are lots of them out there. And then we even did Bell Rock one time. That was one of, on our most recent trip, a very fun hike. Mm-hmm. That is also a vortex. But Sedona has that balance of desert and forest-like and the beautiful colors of the red rocks that they do have out there. Like I've never seen red rocks like I've seen in Sedona, Arizona. It's so beautiful. It's like one of the most beautiful desert landscapes. You know, we always talk about Zion National Park and how it's kind of like foresty and red rock. Sedona is another good match that's kind of similar to that, but a little bit more flat and less mountainous. But they do have those like table mesas and those crazy rock formations that just really pop in the city. One of my favorite hikes to do in Sedona is to Devil's Bridge. It's super scenic. I actually did it on my birthday one year and it's a must do at sunrise because as the sun is coming up at golden hour, it just illuminates all of the red rocks and it just becomes this beautiful orange red glow. It would be a great place to go out and meditate or do a little Tai Chi or yoga. Mm -hmm. When I was there, I did a little yoga session out in the rocks. We did a hike and then a, a little session there and 
It was straight up magical. Highly recommend. I definitely do believe it. Like I said, like you really get that sense of calm and relaxation when you're there. Like you really feel that difference. And I do want to say so everybody is well aware. Sedona is a very expensive city. Like it is. It's really expensive to stay in. And even food is expensive. Mm -hmm. So unless you're eating like at a McDonald's or like... And I don't even want to use the word mom and pop, but like maybe like a quick like takeout restaurant or something like that. Or go to like a, I would say the best thing that we've done before too is go to a um, a grocery store and get food and make it. Like you're on vacation, you're obviously going to want to eat out. And so if you are going to take this trip, just kind of know, hey, this might be a little bit more of a splurge trip. Yeah. yeah. But if you're trying to do it cheap, I think the Airbnb grocery store way is probably the best. Yeah. And that's what I was saying. The only few places to get cheap food, if you really want to, are those kind of things that I just described. Otherwise, even mom and pop like not that. Cheap. Well, I know. And that's why I said like not even like a true mom and pop, but like, let's just say like a Mexican taqueria or something like that. You know, you can find them like still at decent prices, but even like anything that's actually like true sit down, you're looking at anywhere between 20 to 35 dollars a plate on the low end of things you know they have lots of restaurants out there that are like 50 dollar plate plus places Mm -hmm. and they do try to make their food healthier like it goes with the healing vibe of the town a lot of their food is geared more in that direction which is you know makes it a little bit more worth paying more but again if you're budgeting for this trip keep that in mind Two things I want to touch on before we leave. One of them is Bear Mountain, one of the hikes that we did more recently. It is a burner. You gain 2,000 feet in elevation and 2.5 miles, but it definitely gives you amazing, amazing views. And the last thing that I have, I don't know about you ladies, but Brittany, what was that place that we wanted to go that didn't get to go to that has the natural like rock slides? I think it's called Slide Park, actually. Yeah, so I think they have a a state park out there. And you are right, Brittany, Slide Park. And basically, they have little, like, I don't want to call them full-blown rivers, but creeks and streams. And they're really, really smooth. And so you can actually slide down them naturally and go in there. And we were going to do that that one day, but we had that unfortunate thing happen. It was hot during the day. And then by the time we got there after our hike in the evening, it was a little too cold to get in. So if you're going to do it during spring, definitely do it during the day because that morning and evening will be a little too cold. Yeah, we've gone several times now and I still have a list of hikes that I want to do or things I want to do in Sedona. So we're going to go back squad trip and we'll let you know how it is. Lucky number seven on our list, New Orleans, Louisiana, or should we say Nolens? New Orleans. New Orleans. <laughs> how do you say it, Kim? New Orleans. New Orleans. I like that. It is a fun place to go and you do want to go in spring. We've been mentioning weather a lot. This is one of those places in the summer where it is swamp ass central. And in the winter, I went in November for my birthday. It was so fucking cold. Brittany and I went in December (laughs) one time. Cold as shit, man. Cold as shit. And minus the weather side, which is very, very important because, again, this is in that part of the world where we're talking, or not part of the world, part of the U.S. where we're talking about hot, humid, and it definitely is. But one of the main reasons why you would want to go is depending on the year because it always happens and starts on Fat Tuesday. So if it happens to be in March, we're talking Mardi Gras time. Who doesn't want to go to New Orleans for Mardi Gras I would love to. I really would. I still have it in me. Do you? (laughs) I think Kim can bust out that inner under 30 for Mardi Gras. Pool parties, I don't know. Uh, Mardi Gras, yeah. Yes, I can do all of the above. And, you know, (laughs) even if you don't hit Mardi Gras, because it is only a certain time frame within spring, it's still really fun there. If you go down Frenchman Street in New Orleans, then you're going to hit up jazz after jazz after jazz at every bar and restaurant that you go on this street. It's so fun. Obviously, you have Bourbon Street, which is just a a spring break rager all night long, (laughs) every night. And that's fun, too. You definitely have to experience that when you're there. Get those big ass beers. Go into a strip club. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. (laughs) Get those strawberry daiquiris. DM us for the story about the strip club experience Brittany and I had in New Orleans one time. I had a booty in my face. I mean, that was it was quite (laughs) interesting. But you know what? New Orleans is famous for the French Quarter. That's where Bourbon Street is. Party Central, like you said. But the history that goes along with it, the jazz, the food for that matter. But spring, good time to go. In April, they have the French Quarter Festival. In April and May, there's the New Orleans Jazz and Heritage Festival. In May, 
today specifically just the wine and food festival. So lots of good events that they have going on during springtime. Jambalaya or gumbo, guys? Gumbo. That is tough. I think that answer depends on my mood that day, but I will probably go with gumbo. I would say same, gumbo. Gumbo, yeah. But you know what? Forget both of those. I'm talking fried chicken and red beans and rice. Oh, yeah. That's some good Southern food. I'm going to throw this out there. Please don't be haters on us. We had turtle soup when we were out there. Bomb. It was really good. Bomb. There's a place called Coops in the Bourbon Street area, French Quarter. Go there. Best fried chicken, best red beans and rice, best Cajun pasta. It's so good. Mm -mm -mm. Love me some Cajun food. Number eight on our list is one of my favorite places to visit, and it's right here in California, and that is Palm Springs. Love this place. Love the pool parties. Of course you do. <laughs> is, this is this where they splash have Splash House? Yeah, we're on the same page, Brittany. Is they do splash have House? Splash House here in June and August, so not in the spring. Spring is a really good time to visit, though. Palm Springs gets really hot in the summer. We're talking like over 100 degrees mm-hmm. every day. But disgustingly hot, like even up above 110. Which is why you want to be in the pool. Yes, but and why you want to go in spring. Avoid that. Exactly. So even in spring, though, you're hitting like 80s, 90s sometimes. It's perfect weather for laying by the pool. There's also some really cool hiking out there in like palm tree canyons. You know, with that weather that you described in spring, it gives you that early summer weather without having to really wait for summer, but not having the extreme of it too. So if anyone's trying to really escape it and kind of get that warmth, this is a good place to go. And it's not excessive at that time either. I always think of golf courses when I think of Palm Springs. I was just going to say, I would not describe Palm Springs as a party place, although you can party there. It's very much relaxation. There's Mm -hmm. golf courses. There's a ton of spas. spas. It's got a really retro vibe, really like I don't know. It has a different vibe. They have a whole like Rodeo Drive kind of place. I was going to say, I don't remember what episode we talked about it on, but I did mention why Palm Springs is famous. It was really kind of like a desert oasis place that the rich Hollywood elite would escape Los Angeles and that area to go do. And so a lot of what it is now is because of its history of that as kind of the escape. So it does cater to a lot of high-end people, but you don't necessarily have to be high-end affluent to actually go there and enjoy it. You still can, but that's where those vibes that you're talking about can come from. The Ace Hotel's really cool. Saguaro Hotel's really cool. They have one that's rebranded recently to Margaritaville. It's a good place. They have a lot of really cute hotels to stay at. And you're all about those staycations too, aren't you, Kim? Yeah, those are fun. Palm Springs is the perfect place for that. And their whole downtown region, they have good restaurants, a little bit of shopping. So it's a great weekend getaway for the spring. Well, we're staying in California for number nine. We are going north, though, to Yosemite in central California. And Yosemite in spring is the perfect time to visit. I've mentioned waterfalls so many times before in this episode, but this is another place where the waterfalls are just gushing in spring. Kind of the same reason here why we mentioned Grand Tetons and Yellowstone. You know, you get in that fresh snow melt, you're going to see the waterfalls and the natural beauty at their prime and primo before all that snow melt runs off. But Yosemite is honestly, and I don't say this as a biased opinion as a Californian, it is one of the crown jewels of the national park system. And you're just going to enjoy it all here in the spring, coming to life, still that snow, the waterfalls, all the natural beauty, the wildlife, an amazing, amazing time. And in spring, not a lot of people are visiting, so you get a lot smaller crowds, and it's not as expensive for lodging than it is in the summer season. Some of my favorite waterfalls in Yosemite are Nevada and Vernal Falls, and then, of course, the iconic Yosemite Falls. We are actually headed to Yosemite in a month to visit it in spring, and our plan is to hike to the top of Yosemite Falls. The last time that I went to Yosemite was in March and some of the trails were still closed for snow and I did see a bear. It ran right by me. Oh yeah. It was spooky. So just keep that in mind if you're going in spring. There could still be things closed, but the waterfalls are gonna be killer. I was gonna say early March probably for sure, but once you start getting into April and May, definitely not. But then you definitely don't want, I don't want to say you don't want to go in June, July and stuff because it's still very nice, but those waterfalls aren't going to be as powerful at that time. So maybe not March, but April, May, solid times for Yosemite. Speaking of Yosemite, when are we going to do Half Dome, ladies? We got to get our you permits know, and I've do that. I've decided I don't want to do it. 
I was going to say, I think Kim is out on the half dome situation. So after I, I know she's out Angel on, oh, not Angel Falls, Angel's Easter Landing. Landing. Yeah, I know she's out on that, but half dome. I've decided against it okay. personally. All right, Brittany, when are we going? <laughs> We got to apply to the lottery. I know. I'm disappointed in you, though, Kim. Just I would like there. to go to Havasu Pie Falls. <laughs> oh, yes. I would like to do that, too. <laughs> yes, I would. That would be a great spring one also. That would be. We'll have to have an episode on that once we go there. So for number 10, we're going to move you out of California. I know Kim's going to be more excited to talk about this one. She's trying to make it her home here pretty soon. Austin, Texas. Tejas. Everything's bigger in Texas, including the fun. <laughs> <laughs> yes, Austin, Texas is looking to be my new hometown possibly this year, but we'll see. And there's a ton of fun stuff to do. It gets really hot in the summer, but you know what? We're from Sacramento. It's not that big of a deal. But we've gotten acclimated to San Diego. It'll be a little bit of an adjustment for you. I'm just throwing <laughs> that out there, but yes. There's several fun places to go out at night. Rainy Street, Sixth Street, those are all really cool places. Very unique. The neighborhoods are all very different. There's the boardwalk at Lady Bird Lake. You guys did a bunch of like water activities when you guys went, right? Well, we did do the boardwalk at Lady Bird Lake. And I can say that it has really great views of downtown Austin from it. Yes. There's also Congress Bridge, which when I went there, we stayed right next to it. If you go from downtown to South Congress, it'll put you right where the bats come out every single night. And that's something you have to see when you're there. You definitely have to see it when you're there. It's very unique. On top of that, even if you don't want to stand on the bridge, they have night tours where you could go out on kayaks and paddle boards and be under the bridge as they actually fly out. So it's a nightly event and thing that they have there. Very unique, very fun. But you mentioned this, Kim, about like water activities that we did. We didn't do anything on the, well, I should say the river. It's called Lady Bird Lake. I don't know why they call it that. It's part of the Colorado River. It's Texas, that's why. Yeah, I guess so. They just want to be <laughs> uh, different and unique out there. But they have lots of natural like swimming and watering hole areas. Yeah. And we definitely did that. So spring is a good time to go. Obviously, summer, you're going to enjoy it because it's like exceptionally hot and it's a great way to cool down. But it's also very nice to have it be warm, but not too hot and not be burning up either too and just experiencing it. You know what else is bigger in Texas? The barbecue. The bugs. Bugs are bigger. Yeah, everything's bigger. But the barbecue game in Austin, it's crazy. You could literally wait one and a half, two hours easily in line for one of those famous barbecue places. If you're going to wait, I recommend Terry Black's. Just throwing that out there. What I don't understand about that is why do they make you wait in a line? Why don't they just take your number or make you grab a number? Probably just because when you see a line forming, then you're intrigued to go there. And so if everyone was dispersed, maybe it doesn't have that big of an intrigue. I don't know. I don't know the reason for it. But uh, to Brittany's point, you know, there's a place here in San Diego called Carnitas Snack Shack. And there is no sign. Yet the t-shirts that the workers wear say the line is the sign. So maybe that is what theme they are going with for the barbecue. But at the same time, barbecue game strong. Austin, Texas, cool, unique, all-American city in that sense. And definitely don't want to be there during the summer, springtime. Well, I'm looking to move there this summer, so well, I'll you let you can, know. <laughs> you can report back and let us know how you're handling that. There's a lot of beautiful murals throughout the city. There's like 80 plus and there's some really cool ones too. It's a super artsy town. It's a weird, artsy, different kind of place. It's it's really cool. It's a unique Texas city. And a lot of music too, yes. everywhere. Now we're going to take you from the heat of Austin to the chill of Breckenridge, Colorado for number 11 best place to visit in the spring. This is probably one of the most different cities on our list here because there definitely will be snow, especially in early spring, but that's what you're going there for. And we're going here this March. We have tried once before and failed. <laughs> because of a snowstorm that was coming in. But we're doing it again. And right now the weather's looking all right. I don't think we're going to get stuck in the snow. But Breckenridge is known um, as a ski resort town, but it does have activities year round. And we really want to try cross country skiing for the first time. Oh, yeah. We're going to be out there just <laughs> getting it all done. I'm really excited about this. I mean, you know, everyone's heard of Aspen 
Vail, maybe even as of late, like Telluride. But Breckenridge is up there with those ones. So if you've heard of those, Breckenridge is on that list also. So this is a quintessential kind of mountain town that's geared around, you know, snow and winter activities. And here we are in spring. So there still will be snow, but you can also partake in those spring activities, enjoy the mountains, enjoy hiking trails. You know, not all of them are going to be completely covered in snow still. And you're just going to have that fun kind of mountain town vibe. And it's almost in a sense like, straddling the season but giving you that last little bit of winter also while you're here before you go into the long summer. Breckenridge was actually previously a mining town. Did you guys know that? I did not know that. But I hear they have a really cute downtown area with lots of shops and galleries and restaurants. So I can't wait to check that out. On the restaurant front, absolutely. I am getting referrals from my coworker who's there this weekend. Tons of good dinner places. We're going to be eating good. Apreski. Uh, I'm excited about it. So Breckenridge here at number 11 is almost like number one. We are going, we have it planned, but based off of all our research and people we know that have been there, we feel confident in putting it on the list here for you guys. There's also a number of hot springs around the Breckenridge area. Oh, is this why we're going? It was Kim's decision for hot springs. (laughs) We, we were supposed to hit it up that one time that it got canceled. So, yeah, we have to redeem well, ourselves. Well, you didn't even want to cancel on it, Kim. We told you that it was going to be bad. And then Southwest finally had to cancel our I flights know. day of. I said, if we, get, of if we get stuck, if our flights get canceled, we can just go to the hot springs. Oh, that was a good solution. Maybe. <laughs> it's not going to happen this time, though, here. But rounding out the list, number 12, bringing you back to California, Big Sur. Ooh, I love Big Sur. Do you guys remember when we went on that road trip to go to Big Sur and we couldn't go to Big Sur? Yeah, the Big Sur, not Big Sur road trip. Two failed trips in a row here. (laughs) (laughs) But we have all done Big Sur since then. So this is on the list with, for sure, recommendations. Big Sur has the longest and most scenic stretch of undeveloped coastline in the contiguous United States. So beautiful. Those cliffs that are just dangling above the ocean are so breathtaking. The water is crystal blue, crystal clear, really good waterfalls and forests along the coast. Definitely make this a good road trip. Not only that, I mean, the wildlife that you're going to see. We passed an area on the stretch of Big Sur that's famous for elephant seals. And they come land there and give birth and you can see the babies and the pups. And I'm not going to lie to you, unfortunately. Unfortunately, that doesn't take place during spring here when we're recommending to go. But at the same time, it's going to be a good weather. You don't have to worry about those winter storms that are going to cause mudslides potentially and close down the scenic Highway 1. That happens a lot during the winter. Not going to happen to you and ruin your trip here in the spring. And you're just going to get that unique California coast vibe that we are famous for. The Highway 1 is famous for a reason and Big Sur is it. Yeah, getting to see McWay Falls in person was absolutely amazing. It's a waterfall that flows directly into the ocean at high tide. Do you guys know what that's called? Like the term for it? It's called the Tide Falls. Tide Fall. Yeah. So we actually didn't see it at high tide. And so the water was flowing onto the beach and the sand. But during high tide, it flows directly into the ocean. We also stopped at Bixby Creek Bridge, one of the most iconic photo spots in all of California, one of the most photographed bridges in California as well. And for a good reason, too, you have the rolling mountains in the background and then the beach and the ocean coming up under the bridge. It's beautiful. This year in 2022, it is 90 years old, that bridge. Hmm. I thought it'd be older. No, just 90. It's going to be 100 here pretty soon. That's for sure. I think McWay Falls and Bigsby Creek Bridge are two of the pictures that you'll see most when people talk about the iconic Highway 1 road trip. They're just beautiful. And they're pretty close together, actually. Yeah, definitely not too far off. And the beautiful redwoods that they have along the coast. So, I mean, you have the beautiful ocean, sea cliffs, and then you just go inland. And now you have these like majestic forested redwood areas. It's so serene. When I was doing research, you know, a lot of people go in the summer, but I was reading that summer actually isn't one of the best times to visit because there's that summer haze. And so it's not as clear out. So just keep that in mind. Spring, winter, those skies are bright blue and clear. Number 13, we're going to pull a fast one on you because we said we're bringing you 13 of the best places in the United States to visit in spring. 
And this one here, we're going across the border to Valle de Guadalupe. So number 13. So there was 12. This one's a bonus since we're going international. So bonus number 13 here for you guys. We included it because it's literally a two-hour drive from San Diego. So it's actually closer to us here than a lot of other places mm -hmm. in the United States are. Absolutely. We have a whole episode on Valle de Guadalupe. That's episode 77. But spring is a perfect time to visit because in the summer, it's a valley and it gets super hot, super humid. In the winter, it can be pretty rainy. So spring is some of the best time to visit. And it's known for wine tasting. I was about to say, I know we've mentioned it on other episodes. We have episode 77. But did we say yet why we're recommending Valle de Guadalupe? And you just did, Brittany. This is Mexico's wine region. This is their Napa. It is so close to the U.S. border that you are going to have an amazing, amazing time out here. The vineyards, the wineries, they have gourmet food out here. This is a foodie region of Mexico, all types. So really, really amazing things to do out in Valle Guadalupe. I can't stress it enough. We go as often as we can. It's also really relaxing because when you go out there, it's more rural it's definitely away from like hustle and bustle. Mm -hmm. So it kind of like forces you to chill and you're just like in this wide open vineyard drinking wine. Uber doesn't really exist out there. So, you know, you can get a ride in, but you can't really get a ride out. And it's nice. It's an escape away. It's really nice. Yeah. You know, Kim, you found something great. You found the Airbnb experience where they'll literally pick you up from your hotel, take you to like three different wineries. You get wine tastings and tours at each one, and then they will drive you back. And it was literally about $100 a person. Well worth the money because it includes all of the wine tastings, all of the wines that you try. So highly recommend that if you're going for your first time. We've gone back several times since and visited different wineries wineries. And so if you're comfortable doing that, highly would recommend that too. Um, we're recording this episode a little early, but in two weeks, Jamal and I are going back to Valle de Guadalupe and we're staying in one of those bubble hotels and it has its own private hot tub on the vineyard. And I'm super excited. So stoked. So tell everybody listening what a bubble hotel is. So a bubble hotel is kind of like a larger tent, more like a glamping situation. I would say it's almost like an inflatable room. Yeah, like an inflatable room. Kind of like igloo-esque. Yeah. Yes. And I want to say parts of it are clear. And so you can look up at like the mm -hmm. night sky and things climate like that. Climate controlled. But they're very, they are climate controlled. And have restrooms in there. Ours does have a restroom. It does have a queen size bed. Um, so pretty excited for that. That's really fun. And I know some of them are on the vineyard. Is yours on the vineyard as well? On the vineyard, yeah. What a great experience. And so it's going to be perfect because, you know, with the hot tub, it's going to be warm during the day, but in the morning or at night, it's going to be a little chilly. We're going to be able to hop into the hot tub, drink a glass of wine and just relax. Glass? I'm talking about a bottle. A bottle? I'm talking bottle. about a case. Oh. <laughs> That's going to be really fun. Any of these places will be really fun to visit in spring. And they're all close enough that COVID or no COVID, you could make it happen. And we encourage you to get out there this spring, bloom like a flower and take a trip. So we are finally at my favorite part of the episode, which is questions of the week. Our first question we have coming in here. What are some good lesser known spring break destinations? We all know Cabo. We all know Cancun, Miami, lesser known. So I have one actually. Of course I do. Right. Mm -hmm. <laughs> right up Here. your alley, Kim. South Padre Island, Texas. Haven't even heard of it. Probably haven't heard of it, but I have when I used to do some writing and, and work for a travel company, we did a spring break feature and South Padre Island is a big college spring break place. And it's right off of the Gulf, right off of like the Houston area. Mm -hmm. And it kind is, of by Galveston or something yeah, like that. Beautiful yeah, beautiful white sand beach. Oh, wow. Well, we'll have to add it on our list and head out there next spring break. Warm water. Look at Kim repping Texas like she's already living in Texas, Texas over yeah. here. <laughs> Everything's bigger there. <laughs> Even the spring breaks. Now, I know you guys are real big spring breakers. What do you recommend? Oh, you know me, Kim. I don't know. That's actually like a really, really good question. We mentioned several national parks. I would say that is our spring break things. You know, people are going to go to spring break for the party, do the spring break and recharge yourself energy wise and be one with the earth. That is my recommendation and hit up any one of these national parks that we just mentioned. 
You know, another national park that we didn't mention, but I would feel like would be a good place to visit in spring is Big Bend National Park, which is actually in Texas. Mm. Yeah. Oh, okay. Tejas um, again. And it borders Mexico. And so you can actually, in non-COVID times, you were actually able to cross the Rio Grande and go into a village in Mexico, which was super cool. With COVID, they actually kind of closed down that crossing area. So hopefully they'll resume that. And so I can go to Big Bend National Park and cross that off my bucket list. Question number two on our list. This one came in through Instagram. They said, can you tell me more about the Southwest Companion Pass? Yeah. So Jamal and I actually had Companion Pass last year. And so you can earn it. And so you can earn it by flying 100 flights, which is a lot of flights, and that being one-way flight. Or you have to earn 125,000 Southwest points. So you could do that by signing up for their credit card, earning the points from the flights, buying things that add up to your rapid rewards points, which is still a lot. Or you can be offered the card. They have offers quite often, actually. And typically what you have to do is sign up for their credit card when they're offering the companion pass. And then there's usually like a minimum amount of money you have to spend within a certain time period. And if to activate that feature. To activate that feature. And then from there, you'll activate Companion Pass. Yeah, I was going to say, you know, as Bernie mentioned earlier, we're recording this episode a little bit earlier here from when this is going to air and you're hearing it now. At the time of this recording, Southwest is having the promotion. Any I one just of saw their, it on TikTok. I was going to say, any one of their Southwest credit cards, if you spend so much money, I think it's like $3,000. Is it five now? $5,000 within the first three months, you'll go ahead and get Companion Pass. So they put it every so often as one of their sign up offers with their credit card. And obviously you have to meet criteria, but otherwise beyond that, you have to earn it the way Brittany mentioned, either with those flights or with points. And even if their credit card is not offering you companion pass, when you sign up, they offer you those bonus points for initial sign up, And those points count towards your companion pass level that you have to hit. Say it's 125,000 points. And if they're offering you hundred thousand points, well, now you only need to get 25,000 more points and you've hit your 125. So lots of ways to do it. And it's definitely going to save you a lot of money. Brittany and I rocked it last year. I mean, who does not want to fly two for one? What a deal. All right, squaddies, that is what we have for you this week. Thanks for tuning into our episode. Keep the adventures going with us by following us on Instagram and YouTube at Travel Squad Podcast. Tag us in your adventures and send us in your questions of the week. If you found the information in this episode to be useful, or if you thought we were just plain funny, please be sure to share it with a friend that would enjoy it too. And as always, please subscribe, rate and review our podcast, and tune in every Travel Tuesday for new episodes. Stay tuned for next week's episode. We have some more amazing adventures and tips in store for you. Bye, squaddies. Bye.